can't even thank Dean Riley, who's a professor and chair of the Infectious Disease and Vaccinology Division at UC Berkeley. Um, it was interesting reading his bio, bio mm -hmm. I guess, because I didn't know that you trained at Stanford right. as an no, IV fellow. Yes. <laughs> um, but actually started off, um, uh, did his residency at Columbia, was an EIS officer at CDC, um, then came to Stanford to do his IV fellowship, and then was faculty at Cornell um, until he, um, actually for quite some time you were at Cornell. Mm, about seven campus. years, yeah. Mm -hmm. transferred to uh, UC Berkeley mm -hmm. as, as the professor and chair of the division there. Um, it gives me great pleasure to actually meet Lee for the first time, even though we share a, a, a center, uh, Global Health Equity, I'm part of the consortium for Global Health Equity Scholar Program in Slum Health, and so Lee's going to talk to us a little bit about unmasking some of the disparities in Slum Health. Um, and so I'm very Thank much you. looking forward to Thank you. Great. So it's a real pleasure to be back uh, where I spent many years of my uh, life. Um, I was actually as an undergrad as well, so I spent a lot of time here. And uh, I was with Gary Skulnick, uh, who's my mentor. Uh, let me just stick this up. This. Uh, there's no. Okay, it's okay. I'll just use this. Um, and so uh, as a uh, Michelle mentioned we have this uh, consortium uh, that focuses on this new theme of some of the things that we do. It's called Slum Health. Um, it's a consortium that comprises of uh, UC Berkeley, Stanford, Yale, and Florida International University. And I'll mention this at the end because some of you may be potentially interested in participating in this program. But um, so uh, as Michelle mentioned, I, you know, I, I did uh, EIS after my residency, and then I came here to do uh, sort of a molecular biology, basic pathogenesis training. And so I combined my basic pathogenesis training, bacterial pathogenesis training, with my epidemiology training to do what we call molecular epidemiology, and that's one of the courses that I teach. And uh, I'm always looking for new ways to apply this, this discipline of molecular epidemiology to address important uh, clinical as well as public health uh, programs. So I thought I'll share with you one of the things that we, we, uh, we've been doing here. Um, so um, how many of you have you been to India? So you know India. So this is uh, actually when you go, this is Chennai. When you go from the airport into the city at night, this is what you will see. You'll see the, these billboards here like this. And you'll think that uh, India uh, is represented by what's depicted in these billboards. But if you go to this, if you cross this bridge in the middle of the day, this is what you'll see. And this is a part of India which is actually a very large part of India, that you don't really uh, uh, see un unless you're there in the daytime. And you know, in the US, we had just talked about you know, the so-called 1% versus 90%. This is a population that's not represented by either 1% or 99%, because they don't really officially exist. And there are about 1 billion people in the world who live in these kind of communities. And the health impact of what this population contributes to the formal health sector is something that we have to deal with. I mean, all of you in this room at some point is going to be dealing with this one way or the other. And we don't talk about this. And so that's what I want to talk about and share with you. So here is a, um, uh, uh, a cover of a, a magazine from Brazil. And you see this? I mean, you see, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, you have this fence here. This has stopped working. Is there, is there a, is there? Yeah, it's okay. You see this fence, and on this side of the uh, fence, you see this apartment building with a swimming pool in each porch, okay, with a tennis court and swimming pools. And on this side, you have these kind of housing. And of course, in people who live on this side of uh, the fence will, of course, uh, contract those types of diseases, infectious diseases, okay? And, and so will the people on this side of the fence. But on this side of the fence, you see these other diseases that you will never see on the other side. Leptospirosis, meningitis, all the hepatitis, vaccine preventable disease, multi drug resistance TB, and rheumatic heart disease. And I'm actually going to talk about two diseases today leptospirosis and, and rheumatic heart disease, because these are probably diseases you've probably never seen unless you've worked in places like this. How many of you have worked in places like this? Okay, so, okay, so you know that. Okay, most of you have. Good. And I just want to show that, start by 
showing the contrast of the way people live in this community. So you have this side here, this kind of community, it's called the favela, and then you have these, these high rises here, and the high rises, of course, surrounded by walls and gates. And the people who live here probably never venture into this kind of community, but people who he live here will work in these, in these kind of uh, uh, residential units as servants and cooks and et cetera. So, so you see this. But you, so you do have this kind of uh, intermingling. Here is another situation in, in uh, Mumbai, India. So this is the Taj Palace, the most exclusive hotel in, in Mumbai, probably in India. And you, you heard about the, this uh, uh, terrorist uh, you know, attack in that hotel several years ago. But if you walk maybe just 10 minutes this way, you'll come to uh, this type of uh, settlement. And it's actually called Fisherman's Slum. That's the official name for this community, just 10 minutes away by walking. Uh, and I, I took this picture in Chennai uh, because it actually represents sort of the three stages of sort of the, uh, these, what I call, uh, 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 sort of slum development. So here you see these makeshift houses in the front, and then the one in these concrete buildings in the middle represent the sort of the uh, government programs, the sort of projects that we call projects in the U.S. that, that they built for these uh, populations. But in the back you see yet sort of another type of housing. So you see the kind of three levels of housing there. And the disparity across these three type of population, uh, population who live in these types of uh, buildings are just enormous, okay? And so you know about the Gini coefficient, right? You've heard of Gini coefficient? So this is the measure of the, dif the different difference in the highest income earning segment of society and lowest income segment of society. So if you have a Gini coefficient of zero, that means everybody in that society makes the same amount of money. And if you have Gini coefficient of 100, then only one person makes all the money in that community, okay? So the lower the number, the more equal the distribution of income. And so if you look uh, at the two uh, members of the BRICS countries, Brazil and South, South Africa, they were there, but the other two members of the BRICS countries, China and Russia are there, and India actually more equal than the, all of the BRICS countries. And look where U.S. is, it's right here, okay? Oh, great, thank you. Okay, thank you. So U.S. is here, and you know, yesterday we had an election, right? And uh, we almost went this way in terms of number. We may still go this way, but maybe not as fast. Uh, U U.S. used to be much lower in terms of the Gini coefficient. Uh, so, do you know, how many of you speak other languages? Kiji, the, one of the African dialects, Jodopat, Jodopat Pati, Gesekondu, Turkish. This means it happened overnight. What about Ashwai? What about uh, Barriadas? You know that some of you, many of you probably speak Spanish. No. Okay, so you know what Barriadas is, Kampungs, Muduku, Bidonville, Tanake. So these are what the uh, slums uh, are referred to by, in these countries, and and they were depicted here in all these terms. Um, we call them in the U.S. slum, shantytown, ghetto, squatter neighborhood, etc. And uh, so um, in 2003, the uh, United Nations Human Settlements Program published this report called The Challenge of Slums. How, ma how many of you have actually seen this? Okay, so you guys are all involved in health. And this is probably one of the most important documents on health that's, I think, ever been published. It reports the sort of the characteristics and the social demographic characteristics of one billion people in the world who, who live in, th in these conditions. And there's very detailed statistics on this, okay? Um, so, in, in fact, there's the operational definition of uh, slums. These are human settlements with inadequate access to safe water, inadequate access to sanitation and other infrastructure, poor structure, quality of housing, overcrowding, and insecure residential status. And so, if you use the, uh, this definition, right now about one-third of the people in the world live in these conditions. This is the reality right now. Um, and then it's estimated to go up to uh, 2 billion by year 2030, so that's only 20 years from now, less than 20 years. And uh, so this is going to happen long before the impact of things like global warming. So, you know, global warming, the impact of that on population is not going to probably happen till for, for 50 more years. But the same thing that the goal global warming is predicting on the population distribution is going to happen much earlier just because of this urbanization issue, which is something that's not addressed. And it was, it was nowhere in the, any of the presidential uh, campaign discussions. Uh, 
So right now, already 43% of the combined urban populations in developing countries live in these conditions. And the least developing countries already up close to 78% live in this. So, so already, this is the norm of the existence of a large proportion of the world's population. And so um, this report discussed uh, demographic, spatial, economic, legal, and social indicators, one billion people. They also uh, it discusses uh, uh, life expectancy, under five mortality, uh, slum upgrading programs, poverty reduction programs. What do you think is missing from this report? Health burden measures. Okay, there's nothing about health burden in these groups because these are very difficult to measure in these kind of communities. Many of these people who were born there, their births are not necessarily recorded. If they die, their deaths are not recorded. They don't officially exist. They don't exist today. They can't go to school. They can't do anything. Um, and so we get these kind of data from things like national mortality registry, hospital discharge diagnosis, health insurance database, demographic and health surveys, multiple indicator cluster survey, WHO surveys. But there's information disparity in these communities. Okay? So we can get these types. This is where we get things like dallies and all these you know, information of, sort of burdens of, burden of uh, uh, disease. So in, in uh, 2000, UN actually, uh, as part of their Millennium Declaration, said this significant improvement in the lives of at least 100 million slum dwellers by year 2020. And that's great because this is the first time an international organization even used the word slums and recognizes the existence of this population. The problem is that urban population growth is 70 million per year. So this is just a drop in the bucket, 100 million by year. So let me now tell you with this background. Let me just tell you what we do in Brazil. So a lot of our projects are done in Brazil. Uh, how many of you have been there? OK, so you know. Um, and so, uh, I so one of the things that we're doing is just start something we started. You know, uh, Rio de Janeiro is hosting the next World Cup and the Olympics. So the government, uh, Brazilian government, decided to uh, just, just to, uh, uh, to be respected by the world. Try to, uh, they, they started these programs to upgrade all these slums in the city of Rio as well as Sao Paulo and other cities. Okay? So what we decided to do was to really uh, try to assess the impact of these slum upgrading programs on certain types of health outcomes. So I sent a, uh, a student there, an epidemiology student there, last summer to kind of get baseline data before these upgrading programs start. And we're going to do this after the, uh, these uh, upgrading programs are implemented and see what happens. Okay? And so, so these are some of the uh, baseline data that uh, uh, Robbie Snyder got. Um, and so we're going to assess five diseases, uh, three infectious and uh, two uh, chronic uh, non-communicable. And we're going to develop what's called a new slum specific metrics, calculate DALIs. You know, you, you know DALIs, right? These are disability life years uh, lost. So this is a way to quantitate disease burden. Okay? Um, and so for instance, uh, t tuberculosis has a numerical attachment, DALI, in the uh, uh, low and middle income countries. It's about 35,887,000. That's the DALI. But if you look at TB in high income countries, the number is 219,000. So there's a difference of more than 35 million. Okay? But if you look at the slums versus non-slums in those low and middle income countries, we're going to also see a difference. Okay? And we want to measure this, what's called the DALI gap, and then see if the slum upgrading program will decrease the gap. So that's it's a real quantitative way to assess uh, disease burden. So we're just getting that started. Um, and then Brazil itself uses a definition of slum. They call it agglomerados uh, subnumais. Uh, uh, and it's a very similar uh, 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 definition that, that, that the UN uses. So these are uh, uh, settlements consisting of at least 51 houses, illegal occupation of the land, and illegal property construction, uh, possessing at least one of the following characteristics, urbanization outside of existing standards, uh, such as indicated here, and then lacking essential public services, and the in, uh, invaded land, irregular and illegal lots, or clandestinely occupied uh, in a recent period. So th this is uh, part of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, and this, you know, this is the Lagos, right? You know, right? This is Ipanema, where everybody goes, and this is Copa Copacabana. And these pink areas are the sort of slum communities. Okay? So, so the Brazilian government has actually done a very extensive census of, of these communities. And we can actually measure things like income, age, all the demographics. And uh, just to show you, show you uh, the, um, 
age pyramid. And you can see just within the same city the difference in the age pyramid structure. You see how uh, where the bulge is in the slum uh, community versus non-slum community. So the bulge is much lower here. Okay, so this already influences the kind of health problems that, that, that we're going to see, just the difference in age structures. And if you look at the Gini coefficient itself that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, in the slum communities, it's actually quite equal. Okay? It's the most equal segment of Rio de Janeiro. Okay? Because everybody's poor, equally poor. Okay. So uh, for many years, we've been studying uh, leptospirosis and uh, tuberculosis and rheumatic heart disease in Salvador, Brazil, up in the north, northern part of Brazil. In fact, uh, uh, when I was at Cornell, I had an uh, uh, infectious disease fellow who worked with Albert Koh, uh, and I sent them down to Brazil. He's American, uh, and he stayed in uh, Brazil for 15 years working on uh, leptospirosis. Now he's one of the world's uh, well-known uh, uh, researcher on leptospirosis. And, uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what he's done. He's now a member of this consortium at Yale. He's the Yale PI for this consortium. So that's where Salvador is, and this is what it looks like. How, how many of you have been there? I guess you know. This is the uh, Nova where the... Uh, one of the, maybe the opening ceremony of the World Cup will take place. We'll see. But uh, we work in a, uh, one of the community, uh, slum community, called Pau de Lima, which is near the airport. And so in this community, in 19, late 1950s, this is what it looked like. No, ho no housing, nothing there. And then by mid-1970, you begin to see formal settlements outside of this demarcated area. And then by late 1980s, you begin to see these informal settlements. And by early 2000, they're just completely occupied. So this is the community that we've been working for, for the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. And if you close up, this is what it looks like. So you can imagine this is kind of located in a valley and during the rainy season everything gets flooded. You can see the watermark going up. So people have to walk through these flooded areas. And when they do that, the, the, the water there, the rainwater is contaminated with the rat urine. Okay? So you walk through there and the spiral keyed they let the spiral bacteria will bore right through the skin. How many of you have actually seen a case of leptospirosis? Okay, good. So you know this. So they bore through the skin, enter the bloodstream, disseminate all over the body, go to your liver and your kidneys, and you have a kidney shutdown. Okay? And then you have uh, icterus here. We call it conjunctival suffusion. It's a combination of icterus and the uh, sort of dilatation of the conjunctival vessels. This is a man with uh, uh, undergoing uh, uh, peritoneal uh, dialysis. Yeah, because his kidney shut down. And this is a sort of a relatively unusual manifestation of leptospirosis, like a pulmonary hemorrhage. There's a very high mortality associated with this. And what's interesting in Brazil, we've been doing this for close to about more than 10 years. Early on, we never saw these pulmonary hemorrhage cases. And then sometime about four years ago, we began to see these pulmonary hemorrhage cases. And we don't know why. You know, nothing has changed in terms of the host, the community. But we think maybe there was a change in the strain of leptospira over time. And we've sequenced the whole genome of the strains isolated from, from the pulmonary hemorrhage cases and then the earlier cases. And we're trying to characterize what is contributing to this new manifestation of this disease. Okay? So that's one of the uh, so-called molecular epidemiology projects that we're doing. And this is how you get the infection. And you see how, in this case, it's the woman who is doing this. Because we've actually shown that uh, despite the similar level of the exposure, meaning if you do serology, they similarly uh, they have a similar prevalence of uh, uh, evidence of infection, but it's the young adult males who develop the severe manifestation of this disease. Okay? For some reason, we don't know why. We don't know why this is so. The women don't seem to get the very severe manifestation. And this is one of the reasons why the, the government, when we published on this, we, the first publication uh, we uh, had on this was uh, looking at risk factors to mortality. And the government paid attention to this because this was a disease that was predominantly affecting young adult males, which are the sort of main income earners of these communities. Okay, before this, we used to do diarrheal disease projects. And no matter what we published, nobody paid any attention because the kids don't really contribute that much to these communities. Right? And so this is one of the things that we learned in the process of doing this kind of work abroad, that even though let's spirosis itself is not like AIDS, malaria, TB, Working on this project really had an impact because after the publication, instead of getting kicked out from Brazil, the government of Brazil actually contacted us and wanted to set up a similar type of surveillance system in other parts of Brazil. Okay? And, and, and it's a very simple solution. I mean, you just have to close these sewages, 
put in piped water, and that had not only had an impact on leptospirosis, but also had an impact on other diseases associated with water, such as diarrheal diseases and many other types of diseases. So uh, that's what we called uh, the Gandhi's uh, salt march approach to research. Uh, you can think about that a little bit. <laughs> so this is what we do. We map these places and do this. And this is just showing you the, the uh, association of the rainfall okay, with the number of cases. It always follows these heavy, heavy rain, rainfalls. Okay, and then one of the molecular epidemiology projects we did, this was done by one of my PhD students who went down to work with Albert. So, so there are a lot of uh, animals in these communities, you know, goats, dogs, opossums, and we don't, we don't exactly know which uh, animals' urine was contributing to the spread of this. And we found this fire from all these different animals, but it's the ones from the rats that had the same identical genotype as those that we found from Humans. And there were certain types of rats, the uh, uh, Rattus novegicus, that, that carry these organisms. So again, this is just a very quick illustration of how molecular uh, techniques can sort of contribute to the uh, uh, understanding of the dynamics of disease transmission in these communities. And ultimately, so one of the problems that we, we discovered was that the, the, these uh, epidemics of this process always occur during the rainy season. Okay? So what else occurs, do you think, during the rainy season in, in, in these type of places. For those of you who went to Brazil, what happens during the rainy season? Dengue, dengue exactly. You have the mosquito population and you get dengue. Okay? And the initial manifestations of dengue are indistinguishable from those of leptospirosis. You get high fever, myalgia, headache, etc. With dengue, there's no treatment, just supportive care. With leptospirosis, you have to start antibiotics right away. Okay? If you wait too long, there's nothing you can do. All those people who came into the emergency room, okay, in, the, in those early pictures with uh, 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 kidney failure, died no matter what we did. Maybe 15% of them died no matter what we did. So, so we needed to develop a test that can rapidly distinguish dengue from leptospirosis. And so Albert Cole came to my lab. He made a genomic library from one of the leptospires and then cloned the genes and expressed all these proteins. And we found several sets of proteins that were recognized by Anisera in these pH patients that could rapidly distinguish dengue from leptospirosis cases. And ultimately, this was developed into a kind of a pregnancy type lateral flow assay. And this is being now uh, 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 developed by a company in New York in collaboration with the Brazilian government. And one of the things that we also did was instead of giving all the rights, the licensing rights to an American company, we coordinated that with a Brazilian company so they had the patent rights. Okay, so the Brazil can sell these products, okay, instead of having an American company sell it at a much higher cost. So, so these are the kind of things that we try to uh, incorporate into our research projects. Okay? So this is Albert Cole here. Who, this is his team uh, in Brazil, and he actually uses, includes the people who live in these slums as part of the research team. And that's what enables us to go into these communities. And this is Mitomaya Galvão, who is the director of Oswaldo Cruz Foundation in Pio Cruz. And he actually comes to these, these uh, 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 surveys uh, sometimes. Uh, and, and he's very well accepted by this community because when he was a medical student, he lived here. He's from a very poor family in the southern part of Bahia, the state of uh, Bahia. And so the people in this community know, so that's what enables us to work in these types of communities. Okay? So these are some things on the side. Okay, so let me just, the reason I'm hurrying a little bit because I have to go back to Stanford, uh, Berkeley to give a lecture at two. So I'll try to give a little time at the end for discussion. So. Okay, <clears throat> so a rheumatic heart disease. How many of you have actually seen a case of rheumatic heart disease? I have never seen one unless, until I went to Brazil. You know, this is something that happens in my parents' generation, right? In my parents' generation, anybody who has a heart murmur probably has a rheumatic heart disease. But this is a disease that you hardly ever see. How many of you are a pediatrician? Okay. All right. Um, 280,000 new cases a year, about 200,000 deaths. It varies in incidence, low incidence in Cuba. It's about 78 per 1,000 in Samoa. It's responsible for up to 70, 65% of hospitalization for cardiovascular disease in developing countries. And in China, it's the leading cause of valvular damage that needs surgery. And prevalence is significantly higher in kids living in urban slums. And so, uh, you know that uh, this is an immunologically mediated chronic complication group A strep infection, right? Um, 
and it results from repeated episodes of acute rheumatic fever and or gas infections. Um, and WHO, the traditional uh, 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 sort of uh, observation uh, made by WHO, that the prevalence peaks around the age 24 to 35, so young adult age, but recent studies from Brazil suggest that this actually peaks much earlier. So there were two studies done by a cardiologist in Salvador, Brazil. Uh, his first study showed it peaked, uh, the mean age was 12 years, mean age later, nine years. So these are the kids who are actually requiring valvular replacement without, uh, with artificial valves. Okay? And because they're getting their valves replaced so early in their life, they may have to get them replaced again when they're in their 30s or in their early 40s because these valves don't last that long. Okay? So Brazil, Brazil spends more than $50 million a year taking care of these people with these valvular disease. When, for less than a million dollars a year, just give simple penicillin, ampicillin, they can prevent this. Okay. So this is, this is one of the problems. This is the reason this happens is because these kids live in these urban, in these slums. And so traditionally, again, uh, there's been this association uh, with certain uh, genotypes, with certain uh, manifestations, such as pharyngitis, skin infections, or both. But uh, this is actually being challenged by studies coming from Australia by a group, uh, a carapetasis group, where they have shown no association with any genotypes with uh, clinical outcomes. And then in the past, people used to talk about rheumatogenic strains, I guess, but in the uh, 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 southern hemisphere countries, there's no uh, association with any specific EMM type. So the epidemiology of this is, appears to be really changing. Um, and so these are what we're doing. We wanted to sort of assess the disease prevalence, RHD prevalence, uh, develop simpler diagnostic or prognostic tests. And then the questions we had, the hypotheses we had, were uh, these are some of the risk factors that we had considered. Um, uh, is it access to healthcare services? Maybe they're not getting the penicillins, you know, when the kids develop uh, pharyngitis. Or maybe it's a difference in circulating strains of group A strep. Maybe there are indeed so, uh, specific clones that, are, that, that trigger this uh, response. Or maybe there are other differences in biological characteristics. It turns out strep organisms make all kinds of super antigens. There are at least right now uh, 11 super antigens that, that are expressed by uh, group, group A strep. But our hypothesis initially focused on this. So we think that it's the, it's the diversity of these strains that contribute, trigger this. And I don't know if you know, but group, uh, uh, strep organisms, they undergo a lot of horizontal exchange of genetic materials. They're very notorious for horizontal exchange of genetic materials. So we think that this, this will ultimately trigger all kinds of diversity in the strains that circulate in the community and may ultimately trigger this uh, immune response. So let me just provide evidence that that's what, that's what we see. So we do multi-local sequence typing. This is a sort of a new way of typing the organisms. Uh, and uh, uh, most common EM types reported in the world, in the literature, are EM12 and 1. Uh, and higher diversity EM types are observed among gas isolates from African and Pacific regions uh, compared to high income countries. This is sort of the, uh, this p paper that came out in Lancet. So you see, uh, uh, these are EM type, EMM1, EMM12, EM28, et cetera. I don't know if you can see from back there. The ones that are in red are those that are included in this uh, 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 vaccine that's being uh, undergoing clinical trial right now. Okay? And obviously, they chose the EMM types that are going to be represented by the common EMM types in, in developed countries, high-income countries. Right? Uh, so this is in high-income countries. But if you look at the EMM type distribution um, in... Uh, African countries, you see that, yes, you have EMM12 here, but this is EM75, okay? And the EM1 is that way down here. And if you look at the uh, Pacific countries, only EMM1, EMM1 is way down here. EMM12 is not even represented. So if this vaccine became available, it would be, yes, it would be probably effective in developed countries, partly effective maybe in Africa, but not in Asia, Pacific, okay? So... So what we did was we uh, started this project looking at three outpatient clinics. This was done by Sarah Tartoff, uh, who was a PhD student and spent two years there. Um, and two of the clinics that we looked at were uh, those serving slum residents, and one served uh, privately insured residents. This was done between April and October 2008. Looked at kids between the ages of 3 and 15. Cases are defined as those with chief complaint of sore throat and controls with children with other complaints who, not, who came to these clinics but not admitted. 
And so this is San Marcos, one of the slum clinics. This is near the slum that we work in. Quinto Centro is the uh, uh, other slum community. And then this is the uh, uh, private clinic. We had 624 cases uh, and 1,500 uh, controlled children. We found 529 strep isolates, group A through G. 253 of these were gas. And we found 128 from cases and 125 from controls. Okay, so controls, people, kids without sore throat also had gas asymptomatically. Uh, among the cases, 23 were from the slum clinics, 17 were from non-slum clinics. So, so gas clearly is associated with pharyngitis. Okay, so we just uh, uh, proved the, uh, what's already known. Uh, but what was surprising was when we did the genotype analysis, this is what we found. So if you look at the uh, George Valente, which is the private clinic, you see the diversity index, Simpson's diversity, it's 92, okay? But if you look at Quinto Centro and ES, uh, uh, ESM, it was 0.96. And if you look at the Lancet study from Steer, look at this. High-income countries, 92, okay? And Africa and Pacific region. So in the same city, the genotypic diversity of the kids who live in the slums resemble more of those people who live in Africa, kids who live in Africa and the Pacific. Whereas the kids who went to the private clinic, okay, had diversity that would resemble those found in kids who live in high-income countries. So if this vaccine became available in Salvador, it's only going to help these kids, but not these kids. So, so this is very surprising because, you know, I've been talking about disparity of income, socioeconomic status, structural, structure of housing. But it's, the disparity exists even at this biology level. Okay? And so, uh, again, this is something that, that's revealed by molecular epidemiology studies. So, this is, so you see this? These uh, EM12 and 1, just like in high-income countries. And here, EM12 is here, but EM1 is way down here. And then here... EM12 is here, EM1 is here. Okay, so th this was the difference in the occurrence of EM1 between the uh, private clinics and uh, slum clinics is quite significant. So, uh, so we've been talking about different types of uh, disparity in slum centers, socioeconomic, environment, and ecologic, legal, information disparity, and then finally, biologic disparity. And so where do we go from here? Uh, I don't think we can, you know, continue to wait for pop things like alleviation of poverty and disparity. And, you know, we've been talking about this for hundreds of years. We already know this. It's boring to talk about these things. We know that. Uh, and we can't wait for social capital development, technology transfer, U.S. Millennium Goals. Uh, we need act now to formally recognize the existence of these populations. Okay, that's number one. And then assess burden of disease in this population. Develop new metrics. We don't have the metrics right now to assess disease burden in these communities. And then conduct research and report findings in international journals, provide data for national governments, and identify and implement novel interventions specifically designed for slums. So that's what we're trying to do with this consortium that Michelle mentioned at the beginning. So we have this consortium called Global Health Equity Scholars Forum. It's uh, funded by Fogarty. And we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Stanford, Berkeley, Yale, and Florida International University. We have 12 sites right now around the world where we can go and work in this. It's open to Postdocs, uh, residents, PhD students who finish their qualifying exam, and medical students in their third or fourth year. And they can spend anywhere from eight months to 11 months in these places, fully funded. The fellows get paid very well, actually, uh, including research money. Uh, and residents actually will be considered as, as postdocs in this case. But residents have trouble spending, I guess, eight months, right? So. So that may not be quite feasible, but we might be able to be flexible about this. So just contact Michelle okay, about this here, or you know, us in Berkeley. But I uh, wanted to kind of really bring to attention to, to the world, especially the Americans, of this, this, this issue. I think that really needs lots of attention. And so this is the team that's been doing all the work. Uh, and uh, um, hopefully uh, you can participate with us. So I'll stop here.
Oh, so we don't know yet because they're just starting these upgrading programs. But in Salvador, uh, because of the, our work on Let's Process, they, they've been doing some, uh, uh, the city of Salvador has been doing some uh, upgrading programs. So they put in uh, pipe water, they sort of removed trash and things like that. And that actually had an impact transiently. And then, then the infrastructure kind of started deteriorating again. And so we're back to where we were maybe 10 years ago. But, but you know, it's not just uh, implementing these, uh, these upgrading. They have to be sustained somehow. And so that's one of the things that we're, we're struggling with. How do you sustain these things you know, once they are implemented? And, you know, what's going to happen after the Olympics or the World Cup? You know, can they sustain these things? What sorts of hypotheses do you have about why the molecular epidemiology patterns in the slums more closely match Africa and Asia than uh -huh. their neighbors? No, that's a good question. So uh, I think it's just crowding. There's more opportunity for these kids to, to be recurrently infected because of the overcrowding. And so, uh, and so they get infected with multiple different genotypes over time. And after a while, it triggers this, this uh, autoimmune response that leads to rheumatic heart disease. That's just a hypothesis, okay, but, uh, uh, but you know, clearly shown that there's diversity of these traits. And, uh, so we're doing a, a study to just really assess how often these kids develop pharyngitis and, and then you know, also do an echo, echo survey in school kids to see you know, what the real prevalence of uh, rheumatic heart disease is and these things. So those are ongoing, ongoing projects. Okay? Since we have such a wide gene coefficient in the United States, mm. we see this crowding. Why do you think I think it's, uh, it's, that's a good question, you know, so the last, there was actually an outbreak of rheumatic heart disease, in, yeah, it was called, I think in Utah, Utah, Utah too, and there was a, uh, there were some so-called rheumatogenic strains, you know, identified, but those have disappeared, they really sort of, so, you know, I think maybe there are certain rheumatogenic strains, that maybe at least as recognized in, 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 in temperate zones, but they've really, I think, uh, disappeared and they're being replaced by new genotypes. And that may be one of the reasons. Uh, but, you know, well, you know, Americans are always exposed to antibiotics. You know, we have easy access to antibiotics. The antibiotics in the food that we eat, those food that you just ate there. Uh, so I think they're probably selecting for sort of maybe the non rheumatogenic strains. I, you know, I don't know. I'm just hand waving. But, but, but it's true. We don't, we don't really see this disease in the U.S. anymore. Okay. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.